All right, everybody. Hello and welcome to the Not Your Average Investor Show. I'm Greg Cohen. I'm your host today, and we're super excited to have you all. We have a fantastic show planned today, and uh, this is the Prescription for Wealth Show, uh, why doctors and non-doctors look at real estate as an incredible asset class and have that in their overall investment portfolio and why you should too. And we have an incredible guest who I'll get to in just a second here. But I do want to say a special welcome to our audience as you trickle in here. I'm just always blown away by our friends, our audience, our community members here at the Not Your Average Investor Show. You guys just keep showing up and showing up and showing up. And it really warms my soul. I appreciate everybody for being here. I want to say a special thank you to the folks who have been a part of the show over the last couple of weeks, I have not been here. I've been on vacation for the last two weeks. And guess what? My running mate right here is not with me today as well. Pablo is uh, on his version of uh, his summer vacation. And, you know, last Thursday, we had Jennifer Filzen and Lee Bishop run the show. And all of you showed up to support. I was listening to the show earlier this morning on my run. And uh, so thank you all for being there. Special thanks to to Jen and to Lee. Tuesday, Pablo did a great job with uh, our president, one of my best friends, Alex Afakis on the state of downtown. So big thanks to Alex. And uh, Drew Barnhill was on the show prior to that. So just an incredible run of shows. Thank you all for being here and supporting the show while I was out gallivanting around Europe with my family. I want to say a special welcome to our community manager, Madison. How are you doing over there? I am great. Hi, everybody. How were those shows, the last few shows? Weren't they awesome? They were. It was a different feel and I, it was cool. It was refreshing. A new type of face, a new type of information. So. Incredible to know that our community is truly running the show here mm -hmm. at the Not Your Average Investor Show. And without further ado, we have an incredible guest here. We have Dr. Chris Moore, who is a practicing physician who, in addition to being a practicing physician, has amassed a real estate portfolio of 35 properties. Wow running his day job. Incredible there. He is also a real estate consultant. So he helps other doctors, other folks who are non-doctors who want to get involved in rental property investing. He is a client of JWB and a good friend. Dr. Chris Moore, welcome to the show. Thanks, Greg. Thanks for having me. Well, we're super, super excited. I know you and I, I mean, you've been a client for many years now, but we really kicked up our conversation, I think a couple of months ago. And I think we just hit to just kind of a mutual just kind of an aha moment where, you know, we have been doing more and more events specifically to physicians, because I just think it fits so well. Our asset class fits so well with physicians. And I know it's something that you've been incredibly passionate about for many years now with your own story. So why don't we just kind of start with a little bit about who you are? Would love to hear about personally who you are and, and all that good stuff. And I would think it would be great for the community to hear about your rental property experience and how you got to, geez, 35 properties while being a practicing physician. Sure. Yeah. I'd love to tell that story. Again, thanks for having me. I'm originally from New Orleans, Louisiana. I grew up there, went to school there. I've lived in Florida now for about 15 years. I'm a practicing urologist here in the uh, Jacksonville area. I have a beautiful wife, two young kids, 12 and 15. And I like sports. I like to travel. I like to do adventure photography. I like to do a lot, I like to do a lot of stuff outside of my day job. Incredible. What's adventure photography, by the way? So basically what we do uh, once every year or two, we go up to the far north, usually either Alaska, Yukon Territory, BC, place like that. We get, we get helicoptered out into a mountain range, dropped off and picked up seven to 10 days later. So we just camp and hike and take pictures, watch the Northern Lights and kind of get away from it all. No way, man. That sounds incredible. Yeah. Yeah, Sign me fun. up for that trip. <laughs> Well, that's incredible. We're super excited to have you here. There's a couple of things that we do here on the Not Your Average Investor Show. I know Chris has watched a few of the shows. It's his first time being a guest on the show. So if I can reach out to our community here and ask everybody to, to show the support, show the love. And the best way that we do that is something that we call the roll call, baby. Chris, are you ready to rock with the roll call? Sure. If you tell me what it is first. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? We've got crazy nicknames for everybody in the community. Those at least who who are brave enough to uh, say something in the chat. So if you're if you're one of those lurkers out there and you're just watching, but you're not in the chat, the easiest way to get a nickname is to jump in the chat here. But everybody's got a nickname or most people do. And so we're going to run through, we're going to say hello to everybody. And when you see a nickname that you really love or somebody that you recognize, just chime in and you know say hello. So we've got the leadoff hitter. That's John Henning saying good afternoon. We've got Christopher Lee all the way from Fernandina Beach. Hello, all from Christopher. Great to see you, Chris. 
We got Denny Davies. Now, Denny, I know you just moved to Arkansas. And you know, I'm a Gator fan. And your big hello now is hard for me to say because that's the chant that the Razorbacks do in college football. But you know what? I had a little conversation with myself this morning on my run. And I said, you know what? I'm going to have to, I'm going to lean in. I'm going to support Denny. So woo, pig suey for Denny Davies over there. Welcome to the show, my friend. We've got Michael Santorios. Michael Santorios is a longtime client of ours and a good friend. And he is going to be the guest on the client journey of the week, 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 which will be this Thursday. So welcome, Michael. Can't wait to talk more with you on Thursday. We've got the early bird, Dean Curry, checking in. We've got Big Papa. I love it when he calls in Big Papa. We got my dad, Jay Cohen, in the house. Good to see you, Pops. We've got Drew Barnhill, the ringmaster, showing up. We've got Layla Powell, JWV teammate, saying hello there. We've got the fairy godmother of the Not Your Average Investor community, Miss Jen Phils. And thank you so much for being the fairy godmother and for running the show with Lee last Thursday, Jen. We've got Nadine Shaw with his trademark. Good morning, good afternoon, JWB fam. We've got Greg Stone, howdy from New Jersey, Greg. We've got the second family of the Not Your Average Investor Show, Gary and Rosalind Riley coming in from Murrieta, Murrieta, California. We regard you. We've got Lewis Hudnell from the favorite place for Pablo and I to mispronounce. It is Milipitas, California. We've got, let's see who here, who we have here. We've got, wow, just an incredible amount of friends here. We've got Hervé Francois. We've got, you know what? I got to tell you, it's getting hard to get, be able to get, name everybody in the roll call because you all are here. I'm not going to be able to get to everybody today, but I do want to say a special thank you for everybody checking in. Marie Rockoff and, oh man, Eddie Harris from Hot Atlanta, you know, Dave Van Horn. Ruben Robles, thank you all for being here and thank you for checking in here. I also want to remind everybody that we've got this Not Your Average Investor class that Pablo and I put together. If you are brand new or experienced and want to get into rental property investing or take it to the next level, the best thing for you to do is to learn from the experts who have built their own portfolio of over 300 rental properties and have put a class together for you. Uh, this is the Not Your Average Investor uh, Guide to Investing in Rental Properties Passively is the best way to go from zero to 60 and in investing in rental properties. And to do it in two hours or less, there's 20 plus videos, bite-sized classes. Many of you in the, in the audience here have already signed up for the course and enrolled. And it's nine ninety seven. I guarantee you, you can ask anybody here on the class or any, anybody here in the audience, you're going to make more than a grand just by listening to a few of these advice and nuggets that are right there on the course. To sign up for the course, go to notyouraverageguide.com, notyouraverageguide.com and enroll today. So with all of that being said, Dr. Chris, we learned a little bit about your uh, experience. We learned about adventure photography. Real estate can be quite an adventure. And talk to me about what started, what clicked for you, because I know that investing in real estate, investing in rental properties is not a natural investment move for folks. I would imagine it wasn't for you as well. Can you tell people what the trigger was for you to learn and become excited and invest, eventually invest in rental properties? Yeah, absolutely. No, you're, you're absolutely right. It wasn't natural at all. It was, I guess, going back to sometime around 2015, I was in practice for about eight years. And I just had one of those moments, like a lot of doctors do and a lot of professionals do, where you just think to yourself, you know, and I don't think I can do this for another 20 or 30 years. At the time, you know, I was just getting established in the area, I had a young family, really didn't have a lot of time to pay to my investments and whatnot. So I met with my accountant and I told him, look, I've got this hodgepodge of mutual funds and stocks that I don't pay attention to. I need something with cash flow, something that's going to build me a good capital base for the future. And he said, Chris, he said, you know, there's always been and there will probably always be a demand for rentals, single family homes in the low six figures. They give good cash flow. They appreciate. You have a lot of good tax benefits and they're easy to transact if you need an exit. So took his advice, did some poking around online. I uh, read a couple of books that I highly recommend, read them two or three times actually, and just kind of mulled it over for a couple months and decided it was time to get my feet wet. So I was introduced to a realtor who fortunately had some experience in investment property. And I said, okay, I think we're ready to start buying. So he sent my wife and I, he would send us you know, a list of properties on MLS every few days. And we would go out with him on weekends, after work, you know, looking at these properties. And, you know, when they say your first property is the most difficult to buy, they're not lying. I mean, we looked right. at probably, I don't know, at least 20 properties over the course of uh, several months. And just with our inexperience, we would 
see things like the color of the carpet or the the color of the house and decide, oh, we don't like it. We'll move on. And, you know, looking back, every one of those 20 properties would have been a great addition to the portfolio. But at the time you see those things and they, and they kind of turn you off. So we spent months looking and eventually there was a property in the Mandarin area that was a foreclosure and the bank was taking best and finals. And he said, I think you should make an offer. So we did. And I think we offered like 120,000 or something and got a call the next day saying, Hey, you, you were the best offer. So the mm-hmm. place is yours. It needed a lot of work, needed a new roof and, you know, just some other stuff. So my wife fortunately was able to work with contractors and, you know, kind of get the place turned over and rent ready. And then from there, I, you know, I think the next two, number two and number three came pretty quick, probably within a month. And then from there, within a year, we had uh, acquired 10 properties. Everything from, you know, like the foreclosure, there were a couple that were just, that we just found on MLS that were rent ready. There were some that we bought wholesale. We paid like 20 or 30,000. I mean, the places were uninhabitable. We had to tear them down to the studs and completely redo them. So kind of, kind of all types within those first 10 properties. Took out a conventional mortgage on each one in our personal names, just because that was a process we were familiar with and you you can get, you know, good 30 year rates. So yeah, I'd say like probably mid 2000, I don't know, early 2017 or so, we had the 10 properties. They were all performing. They all had renters in place, cash flowing. And it's kind of the point where you just step back, take a sigh of relief and say, okay, you know, check the box. We did it. We're happy. Absolutely. I mean, who, who wouldn't be happy, especially buying when you did uh, mid 2017. And and I got to tell you, it's uh, it's an incredible feat. I know we just spent, you know, a few short minutes talking about that transition, but I can only imagine the transformation from going from not being in real estate to buying 10 properties in your first year, right? Like what an accomplishment, stepping outside your comfort zone. It sounds like you had an incredible team around you, starting with your accountant who fully understood the profit centers that come along with rental properties. It's. Do you find that it's more likely to find accountants that are proponents of real estate in your experience? Uh, I think it's difficult to find accountants who also give you a lot of good financial planning advice. Uh, Fortunately, I had one. Yeah, absolutely. I think it starts with the team. And many people overlook a great account as being a super important part of your team. And as you make more money in rental property investing, they become even more and more important as well there. You mentioned a couple of books that you seem to just love. You've read over and over again. You want to share those books for for the audience? Yeah. The two books I always recommend to people are the book on rental rental property investing by Brandon Turner and another one called Investing in Real Estate by Gary Eldridge. I read those books probably each two or three times and felt like that gave me a very, very good foundation to start out. I know a lot of people who did seminars and paid a lot of money. I didn't do that. You know, I did my own sort of research. I was meeting people in town who were in real estate. I just kind of picked their brains to get their experience and, and just kind of build on that. Totally understand. That's that's incredible to be able to have those. And the books were the start for me too. I read some really great books and then it led me to networking. It led me to meeting other people who were more successful than I was at this venture. And then from then on, you know, you can find more expensive ways to gain knowledge from that point. Let's just talk about the, the financing angle. I think that really trips people up a lot. Talk to me about the financing angle. You bought each of these 10 properties with a conventional mortgage. Did you buy them at like in bundles? Did you buy them one at a time? What? How did you do it? No, these were all single loan per property. There were a couple of times where we would have a closing for, you know, two or three properties at a time, but it was, it was all, you know, single conventional mortgage per property. Okay. And the reason I did it is because I didn't yet have an, you know, an LLC structure set up. I knew that I could get a good 30 year rate and I, I figured while I was building up, you can always refinance in the future, but at the time I was a good, it was a good, you know, sort of springboard. Do you remember what your interest rates were? Yeah, that they were at around 5.5, 5.75. It's kind of what I was thinking. You know, yeah. which is really similar to what the evaluations are for your turnkey investment properties with JWB or, or probably many other turnkey providers, right? And when I started to invest in 2006, my interest rates on my loans were seven and a half percent. So people lack perspective on what good interest rates are. We think just because they're not in the threes anymore that five and a half or six percent is not doable. But you've seen yourself, right? You you tried to gobble up as many as you could, and you even said here. If all of those houses that you passed by because you didn't like the color of the shades or whatnot, if you could have had a five and a half or six percent mortgage on those, I'm I'm sure you would have gobbled them up as much as you could, right? Yeah, of course. You know, at the time there's no recency bias because there was no there were no three percent interest rates three years ago to compare that to. At the time, five point seven five was great. Yep. 
All right. So now for most of the audience, the most of our audience either is working with JWB already or is thinking about it. And this is, you know, JWB is the, the passive approach, the turnkey vertically integrated approach. Chris, you've done a little bit different, at least to start out. It was different for you. Let's kind of like paint the compare and contrast what you were able to do largely by taking a more active approach or, you know, building your own team versus more of a turnkey experience. Could you give some pros and cons? Well, I have a, I have a little bit of experience in both. The pros of, of doing it yourself is, you know, in some market conditions, you're able to acquire really good properties at really, really low prices. And if you have the time and the inclination to put the work in, you can get a really good return on your investment. So there's a lot of upside by doing it that way. I did also buy a couple of turnkeys back then. This is my pre-JWB years, but at the time they, they weren't new construction, they were rehabbed homes, but everything was brand new. There was a renter already in place, so they were cash flowing from day one. And I always felt like I was paying a little bit more for the property than I would have if I'd have done it myself. But I keep a lot of spreadsheets and records on my portfolio performance. And when you look at those properties over the last six, seven years, they have performed the same, if not better than some of the ones I built from the ground up, just because there's no, there were no maintenance headaches at all. And, you know, I just think it's really interesting just in the short time that we've talked here, it seems like if there was a, something that you could have done differently, it would have been buying more properties back in the day. Right. And the ability to not get hung up on the details of what's this house look like on the outside or whatnot. Right. The game here is acquiring assets. And if you can do it in a, in a way that's passive, that's fantastic. If you have a partner that can allow you to acquire these assets, then that's fantastic in a passive nature. That's what you're looking for. But at the end of the day, right. The reason why Chris and myself and so many members of our audience here are so excited about this asset class is because it's a better asset class. And the goal here is just figuring out how you can stack these assets in your portfolio as early as possible. And then you hold on to them, right? Chris, how long have you held on to these assets so far? Late 2015, early 2016. Yeah. So you're, you know, we're seven years or so into it. Do you see any reason of of offloading these assets, or is this something that you see as a long-term buy and hold? No, I have, I have no uh, no plans to offload anything soon. When I went into real estate, it was always a, as a long-term investment. If people ask where their real estate price is going to be like in five years, I mean, who knows what they're going to be like? Maybe they'll be higher, maybe they'll be lower. But over time, there will be a pretty consistent appreciation. You'll have up cycles and down cycles. But if you take a buy and hold approach for you know 20 plus years, it's going to be hard to lose out. Hard to lose in real estate if you hold on for the long haul. It's just as simple as that. You just don't typically lose. And Chris, you know, I think this would be a great time for us to zone in on the physician, the physician investor, and understand their challenges and understand why you have found this to be such a successful venture for you being a practicing physician as well. Can you talk to me a little bit about your friends, your colleagues who are physicians and, you know, maybe what their pain points are? And then you know, why they may be interested in real estate, but what keeps them away from real estate and how you've been able to overcome that? Yeah. So physicians are, are very hardworking people. They're smart. They have good credit. They make a good living. And a lot of them want to get involved in asset classes other than, you know, the stock market. Maybe they have somebody that manages their money. So they just kind of let them handle everything. Maybe they're intimidated by the time commitment. They have, you know, they're working long hours and they don't feel like they have the time to put into real estate. So frequently people will say, hey, I want to get into real estate, but I just don't know how. So I've, I've thought about that quite a bit. And the, the three things I've noticed are number one, everybody always thinks they're getting in too late. I remember in 2016, when we were buying these first 10 properties, I remember thinking to myself, man, the people who got in in 2012 and 13 are making out like bandits. We're getting in at the top of the market and this and that. And the top of the real estate market is always like, it's like a mirage. It's always two miles down the road. You know, you, you kind of keep going there, but you never really, you never right. really reach it. So, you know, because of our recency bias, which I was talking about earlier, we know what these properties were going for three or four or five years ago, and we're seeing what they're going for now. So you just kind of naturally think that they're, that they're overvalued. But again, if you're in it for the long term, then that really shouldn't, shouldn't matter anyway. The other thing is that people look at real estate through the lens of their other investments. So for example, if you're primarily in stocks, you know, if we just ignore options and dividends and, and all that for the moment, if you're in a stock, you're, you're putting money into a company that you think is going to return value to shareholders and increase in value. And your exit is if the price per share increases and then you sell it and then you make a profit. So they, they look at real estate appreciation, which, you know, over the years may average, you know, three, four percent, something like that. And they say, well, you know, why do I want to plunk down all this money for something that's going to return three or four percent? 
percent. You can't look at it that way. You have to look at real estate as something that will appreciate over the long term, but in the meantime, will also give cash flow. There's a lot of tax benefits to real estate. I mean, when I do my spreadsheets to to calculate returns for properties, I really don't even account for appreciation because to me, that's such a small part of it. I really look look for the the cash flow, the tax benefits. And then you have to remember that all that is amplified by leverage. I know you've probably done whole shows on leverage, but that literally like ups your returns by three, four or five X. So looking at it in a different light. And then the final thing is they think it's going to be difficult. People always associate real estate with getting the, you know, the stereotypical call for the clock toilet at two in the morning, but that, that never happens. You have a, you have a property manager that handles those calls. You, you'll have to approve, you know, some larger work orders, but I spend very little time during the day or during the week dealing with the nuances of owning properties. Yeah. Why do you think that is that people just assume it's going to be difficult? It's like, we have so many service providers and other parts of our economy that makes something that would be difficult, easy. And we pay those folks a a rate and then they make life easier for us. Like, why do we just assume that that's impossible in rental properties? I think probably just because of the size of the asset. I mean, you can buy a stock for a few hundred dollars or a few thousand dollars, but if you're buying a $200,000 single family home, you just kind of assume that everything's going to be bigger. Yeah. I'm with you there. I think, so I wrote down the time component. People don't feel like they have enough time the recency bias, which makes it difficult for people to take action. And then people just assume it's going to be difficult. But you know, you have solutions for all three of those. Obviously, you've been able to overcome all three of those. The time component is the one that I wanted to focus on for you. It seems like you know, now that you, you're a JWB client and Dr. Chris built his portfolio of those 35 properties, and then he brought those over to JWB for us to do the property management for him. So he didn't acquire those through JWB. He did those largely on his own with the team that he created. And that's an incredible opportunity. We love serving clients that bring client, uh, bring properties to us, but I'm really interested on the time component. How did you do all this? I mean, I would assume as a practicing physician, you're, you're working a regular, regular job. Like how did you figure out, how did you solve the time component and how can other physicians and non-physicians learn from you? I think most of it's just time management. Fortunately, you know, my wife was very active in rehabbing the properties and dealing with some of the day-to-day stuff, but you know, the turnkey properties I've spent virtually no time at all it's really just, you know, decent time management. I mean, I probably spend, you know, with, with all my different investments, uh, other than real estate, I probably spend, you know, maybe five hours a week. You know, half of that is just menial tasks, like, you know, putting things into QuickBooks and the other half is strategizing, mm-hmm. but you can really spend as little or as much time as you want on it. You know, it's, mm-hmm. it's very easy just to acquire a property that's got a tenant in place and you just kind of let everybody else do the work and collect your check every month amazing. And, you know, obviously I'm biased, but you have a great team to support you and you have great teammates. It sounds like even beyond JWB that have supported your journey all the way throughout. I think people don't realize that real estate investing is a team sport. If not, you're not going to make it to the finish line or you're not going to enjoy enjoy the journey. And it seems like you really understood the power of a strong team early on. And again, want to say thanks to everybody for putting questions in here. We've got a few questions that I think are going to be great for you, Chris. So let's let's weave a couple of these in right now. And everybody else, if you'd like to continue to fire those in, we'll get those in during the show as well. Michael Santorios has a question. He says, knowing what you know now, is there anything you would have changed if you could have gone back and done that on your first property? Tough question. No, because it's worked out really well for me. So I think the way that I started uh, was good because I got to see all sides of it. I got to see everything from, you know, the foreclosures, the wholesales, going to a place that you couldn't even walk in the front door because it was such a mess and sort of, you know, building that up. Everything from that into a home that's already rent ready. I think having the background of seeing things like that has probably helped me out. So no, I wouldn't have done anything differently. It sounds like you wanted to build a real estate business here in addition to your career as well. It sounds like you wanted to know all the details. Is that that pretty accurate? It is. um, But also remember at the time, I didn't know anybody who was really doing turnkey. So that wasn't really an option. I mean, really my only option at the time was to meet with a realtor and have him send me properties and go look at them and just kind of, you know, start that way. I think that I was kind of lucky in the beginning that I had a really good realtor. I also got a good property manager early on who sort of helped me network around town. And, you know, funny story, after the, the 10 properties, after we were done with that, and, you know, as I said, we were breathing that sigh of relief. Literally like two or three weeks later, she calls me up and she says, hey, I have this friend. He's a local investor. He's going through divorce. He's got these 12 properties and he's got to liquidate them to satisfy the terms of his divorce. And oh, by the way, you have to let me know by tomorrow morning. Otherwise, I'm moving on to the next person and you That's got to right. close within 14 days. So these 12 properties, he wanted like, for the bundle. 
you know, they had, there were, there were problems. Like I think only three of the places had runners on a lease. There was a lot of deferred maintenance and this and that, but there was a huge upside to it. So called in the next day. I said, sure, I'll take it. I mean, I had no idea how I was going to get $700,000, but I was like, yeah, I'll figure it out. I'll take it. So that's kind of how I get, I got introduced to the world of hard lending. She introduced me to some hard money lenders. I kind of hit some people up on my own and was able to, you know, gather the funds to, to close on that deal. And that was how I got number 11 through, I guess, 23 or 24. I also got into commercial loans at that point. By this point, I had you know a structure of LLC set up. So I took these 12 properties to a, a commercial bank and said, hey, I want to I want a loan on these properties. And by this time, the I had built up enough equity in the original 10 to where I could, you know, cross collateralize those with the new loan. So I don't want to say I got these 12 properties for nothing, but I, I kind of basically did. They kind of all bundled them into one. And I repeated that process um, two or three times over the years. So as as of now, the 30 something properties are all in one commercial loan at, at 4%. Pretty incredible. I would venture to say you're not the average investor, right? I would venture to say you're not the average rental property investor for sure. It seems like I can kind of see a smile on your face when we're talking about- I've heard that before. <laughs> right? Like when you're, I can see it when you're, when you're talking about putting together this 700 grand and you know it's got to be a yes or a no today and close in 14 days. You, you kind of like that stuff, don't you? It's fun. Yeah. <laughs> So, and that's incredible. I, you know, I have, I have that gene as well. And I like that, but I also know that that freaks some people out <laughs> and that not everybody is built that way, but this asset class, and I know you and I are aligned on this, this asset class and access to this asset class is so needed because frankly, stocks and bonds are not cutting it for the average American because not because they don't work long-term, but because they're so volatile and you don't know when the up and when the down is going to be. And if you need to access and start your life, your retirement or your life, depending on these assets, and you're in this valley, that affects your quality of life. And you know the reality is that real estate is incredibly consistent over decades and decades and decades. So I know we're aligned and that this access to this asset class is critical. It's paramount. And it's why you have really taken on real estate consulting. What do you say to people that maybe aren't like you in a sense that they are never going to get excited about coming up with 700 grand to close on a property in a week or two? They do not want to go on, I think it was 20 property visits and sending in offers for like six months. They do not want to deal with issues that you find once you own these properties. They, they honestly don't even want to like think about what it's like to cross collateralize loans and all that good stuff. What do you say to normal physicians who want to get in this asset class? How do they do it? Well, I mean, you don't have to. I mean, so just real quick, going back to what you were saying about stocks. One thing I, I tell people is when you compare the performance of my real estate portfolio to the performance of the, the S&P, when you take into account the appreciation, depreciation, cash flow, it doesn't really blow it out of the water. But even in the bull market that we've had over the last few years, uh, it's actually outperformed the S&P. And I mean, every every portfolio should have a cash position. You should always have cash on the sideline for those you know rare times like COVID where, as Warren Buffett said, it rains gold from the sky. But if you are consistently keeping cash on the sideline, thinking that you know at some point in the next two or three years, the market's going to drop and you're just going to swoop in, like you're you're also missing a lot of opportunity costs there. Even with the market the way it is now, you can easily get you know 13, 14% internal rates of return. So kind of leading into your second question, the answer is if you don't want to worry about cross collateralizing loans and all that other stuff, you really don't have to. I mean, it's almost it's almost as easy as buying something on Amazon nowadays. You have inventory on websites, you can see what the insurance is going to cost, you can see what the projected cash flow is. There's probably already a renter in place. All you really have to do is buy it. I mean, absolutely. And that's why a vertically integrated company like JWB is around, right? All of these things that Chris just overcame to build his portfolio. I mean, he did a great job, but you don't have to do it that way. I mean, you probably didn't even know that there were options like turnkey properties available at that time. If you had known back in, two, in 2017 or 2015, 16, 17, that you could have done it turnkey, would you have? Absolutely. You, you would have? Not the whole portfolio, but I definitely would have certainly added some homes to the, to the portfolio. I mean, when I started out, I didn't even know what turnkey was. I mean, I, I didn't hear that term until, you know, at least several months or a year into it. And it's like, there are people that do this. They build homes, you know, put a renter in and then sell it. They make their money and you get this, this asset. At what point did you figure out that JWB does it? Just curious. Let's see. So I got with JWB in 2017 or 18. And I think when I was introduced to the lending side of things, uh, that's when I learned about their, so it's kind of in a roundabout way, actually. 
Yeah. So, and then we, we were just talking off camera about how we, we came to, uh, to serve Chris in his portfolio. And, and we actually purchased a property management company that Chris had his properties with. And so when we purchased that property management company, Chris became a client of JWB property management back in the day. And so that's how he officially came to our services. I wish we would have known you in 2015 or 2016. We could have helped with those turnkey properties. <laughs> that, that would have been helpful. <laughs> <laughs> but there's something to be said for doing it, quote unquote, you know, the hard way, even though it sounds like you had great people around you, but man, I've been in your shoes. I know what it's like to have to come up with a lot of money in a short period of time to acquire properties. I know what it's like to pound the pavement and put in offers and get rejected over and over and over again. I know what it's like to buy properties, get excited about it and peel back the walls and maybe not be so excited. And that's honestly why we started this company the way we did. It's because most people don't want that. And the reality is that the asset, if we go back to like why this asset, access to this asset is so important is you can do it in a way where you can lean on a team like JWB, or you can build your own team like Chris did, but you can lean on a team like JWB who makes that process easy. And then we're just on that even playing field with stocks and bonds. And this asset class wins versus stocks and bonds. It's better performance, just like Chris said, right? His returns on investment compared to the S&P are better than, his, than, than the S&P over since he's been investing. And the consistency is there. There's not the volatility. So if you can just make this asset class easy, then you unlock this asset class for everyday Americans. And that's why we're here at JWB. If, if you would like to have a conversation about that with JWB, go to chatwithjwb.com, chatwithjwb.com. And I also want to reach out or encourage you all to reach out to, to Chris as well. You know, Chris, Chris is a real estate consultant. He helps doctors, friends, colleagues, and even those who are not doctors take this leap to invest, you know, in, he can help you if you're going to do it actively. I'm sure he'd be willing to give his advice, but he also helps people do it from a turnkey perspective. Guess who he recommends to invest with? You guys know by this point, he recommends JWB and also private lending as well. Man, this is awesome. We have a whole bunch of more questions here. Why don't I fire a few more here? Here's one from Not Your Average Guest. Chris, that's a lot of properties that you had. It sounds like you have them under your personal name. As a physician, were you worried about liability? Yeah. So originally I had them in the, in the personal name, but after I did those first 10 and then sort of acquired more, we established a, an LLC structure. So every everything after that was bought with an LLC and they all have commercial loans against the properties, which are loaned against the LLC. So yeah, absolutely. At the time, it was just, it was kind of an easy way to get in. A lot of banks won't lend to LLC. So it took me a, a little while to kind of figure that part of things out. But yeah, absolutely. I mean, the goal was, was never to keep the properties in the personal name. It was to acquire them and, you know, get them out of the personal name as quick as I could. Yep. This is a great question. We get it often, especially for somebody who's starting the, their investment with JWB is, you know, how do I take care of the, the liability? And there are, there, there are a number of different ways to, to attack the problem. You know, focusing on making sure that you get the right financing in place is probably paramount, right? And so keeping them in your personal name is not necessarily a bad thing. You can keep it in your personal name forever if you want. You can just wrap a lot of insurance around it. You can go down the route of putting it into an LLC as early as you want as well, but you have to take into account financing as well. If you start to go down the LLC route, it makes the financing more challenging. So another reason, if you have a question like this, get on the phone with my team, talk to Chris, talk to folks who have been in those shoes, because that's one of the challenges I think that people create in their mind and they don't understand how to do it. It's one of the easiest problems to solve. I would imagine, Chris, it's one of the things that you don't even think about at this point, right? No, I mean, it was, you know, it was kind of intimidating at first, but yeah, it's, it's, it's really not a big deal at all. Yeah. A uh, quick question from Marilyn Cotterman, who is from Homosassa, Florida. Chris, that is the home of the manatees. And we love Marilyn being on the show. She is a regular on our show. She just said, sorry. I was like, what kind of physician are you? I'm a urologist. She is, or he is a urologist. Fantastic. Denny Davies, another longtime client and friend of the show says, Chris, is your methodology for convincing doctors and medical professionals to invest in real estate transportable to other professions? If yes, what aspects? Yes, all of it. I think that, you know, doctors aren't alone and that they're, again, you know, smart people, good living, kind of a thirst for knowledge and a thirst to expand. And just like I had the moment in 2015, I think everybody has that at some point where they, they, they just don't see themselves working in their current capacity for another 30 years. So it, it's, it's not doctor specific all, at all. It can apply to any profession, I think. Yeah. Let's, let's dive a little bit more onto that, the thought process for doctors and, and not working in the future. You know, I know you shared with me that you had a, I think it was a torn ligament in your wrist. 
right? Mm -hmm. And I think that was a, the, the big thing for you because, you know, obviously you need your hands to do all the amazing work that you do. And so I, I was talking with another friend of mine who is a doctor as well. And he started to tell me, he's like, you know, what would I do if I couldn't use my hands? My wife is, she's a nurse practitioner and she works in aesthetics. And so she puts Botox and fillers and Juvederm and all this good stuff. And her hands are her business. And so, you know, if she doesn't have her hands to work, like what would she do in, in essence, right? Do you think that doctors worry about this potential loss of ability or desire to work? Is that, is that a running thought often? Probably not as much as it needs to be. No, I mean, not at all. You know, in, in January, I, I tore a ligament in my wrist and it didn't heal. So I had, I had surgery to reconstruct it in March and I was in a cast for three months. I couldn't do any surgery. And that's, you know, when you and I started talking because, you know, fortunately I had sort of built a good foundation with real estate. And then I started talking to you about how we can, you know, collaborate and take this another step. But before this injury, I hadn't thought about that possibility at all. You know, you kind of, you kind of just, you go through your normally normal day and you think you're invincible and then something like that happens. And you think, well, if they can't fix this thing, then my hand's out of business and then I'm out of business. So what am I going to do? <laughs> you know, you really start to think about things. Yeah. What, what would a doctor do at that point? I mean, is, I mean, I guess you, can you, consult, I guess, without doing the procedures. I mean, cause you're, cause depending, on, depending on your specialty, I mean, yeah, depending on your specialty. I mean, for me, surgery is about, you know, it's almost half of what I do. So it would be a huge loss and, you know, sure. I could consult, but it would be a totally different capacity that I'm in now. Yeah. And if you don't have assets that are contributing through all five profit centers, one of those being cash flows, one, you know, two, the second one being tax savings or principal pay down, right. These are things in addition to inflation hedging and inflation profiting. Those are the, the, the hidden profit centers of rental property investing. The, the last one is, of course, home price appreciation. But if you're investing in the stock market, all you are investing for most often is just stock price appreciation. So if your day job is not, you're not able to perform it for whatever reason, it could be really a tough spot, right? Why not take some chips off the table why not reallocate some of the funds that you probably have in the stock market or in bonds and put those into an asset class that can perform for five profit centers, can you know build up income and isn't just so dependent on speculative appreciation? I would imagine you agree with that. <laughs> I didn't know that was a question. <laughs> it wasn't actually. There we go. <laughs> so we've got uh, our friend from France, Anonymous Attende, from my friend Pablo, who is not here. He loves when our friends from France, Anonymous Attende, shows up here on the show. They say, I have a single property I rehabbed and it consumed all of my cash to finish the project. Now I am trying to decide how I can secure my next property, given I have very little cash flow at this time. And I don't want to wait several years before I get another property. Any suggestion that I might be able to explore? Chris, what do you think? Well, if this is a property that they bought with cash and then spent their money to rehab, I would assume there's some equity in the property that they could take to the bank and tap out and then use that equity to buy another property. That would be the, the easy way to do it. Yeah, absolutely. That's something certainly to explore. And, and I tell this to people all the time, and I don't know if everybody believes me or not, but I'm telling you the money problem is the easiest problem to solve. I tell you this because, it, listen, I, at 23 years old, I didn't have money to do this, but I created structures with other people to allow me to raise funds to be able to buy rental properties. And you know that is possible for all of you because I did not come from a rich family. I did not have a rich uncle. I didn't have real estate experience. I didn't have, you know, I was 23 years old and this type of Abundance mindset mindset is available to everybody here. There is something that you can offer to somebody else who may have money and you might be able to partner up. So if the money problem is what's holding you back, I've got about a billion solutions for you. Your, your, my team has about a billion solutions for you. If you have the money problem right now and that's holding you back, you should be on the phone with my team. Go to chatwithjwb.com. Another source of, of income that, I mean, I was just on the phone with one of my best friends who's going to be investing with us here in, in the next couple of days. And uh, we were talking about him reallocating some of the money in his investment portfolio. He's got you know more in stocks and bonds and things like that. We talked about how to use a 401k loan to free up capital that you can use to invest in your turnkey rental property with JWB. And so that is available to almost every single one of you. Most 401k plans out there, when you're with your current employer, allow you to borrow up to 50% uh, of the value of the 
uh, portfolio or a max of $50,000. And I would imagine the vast majority of you that's available to, but you just have that money just sitting in your 401k. I don't know how you feel about the stock market going forward. It's up to you, but all I know is it's way more volatile than rental properties. You could use that money as you know, most of your down payment on your next JWB rental property or any other type of rental property. You know, so there are so many hidden ways that you probably have access to, to, to solve the money problem. I'll jump off my soapbox now, but, but there you go. Thank you so much for the question. Uh, we've got Marilyn. And did you want to add anything onto that, Chris? No, I think everything that you said is correct. I think the the holy grail of a good investment portfolio is one that's got free cash flow and a, a capital base that stays constant. So you never have to, you know, draw down from the, from the principal. But I, I kind of smiled when you said that about the, about the 401k, because with that bundle that I bought, I was, I, I obtained like, you know, seven, eight hundred thousand dollars worth of hard money loans, but I was still $50,000 short. So I did, that's what I did. I, I took a $50,000 advance from my 401k. And then go. when I, you know, when I cashed out, I put that back, but yeah, talk- that, that it was kind I, of a good emergency loan. <laughs> why don't we talk about that? Because I think there's so much emotion wrapped up in a, a loan against your 401k. People think this is bad to do. Can you, can you explain what that is and maybe, you know, why, it, why it was able to help you and maybe un, uncover some of the, the myths that maybe people have about the 401k loan? Yeah. I mean, I'm probably not the expert here, but why did it make sense to you? Well, I needed the $50,000 and that's the only place I had it. <laughs> <laughs> the time. There you go. So, I mean, I don't, I don't, I, you know, every plan is different for my particular 401k. The max loan that you could take out was, was $50,000 and the interest rate wasn't bad. It was, you know, at the time it was maybe like 5% or something. So I kind of view it as a good emergency source of funds. I don't think it's something I would, I would hold long-term. I think that, you know, if you take this money out, you acquire the property, then either put it back, you know, with the cash flow that you get from the rents, or if you end up refinancing to put it back, but I don't really see a problem with it. Yeah, I don't either. And I'll, I'll kind of go a little bit farther, you know, because I have some experience in this. I, I take a 401k loan against my 401k all the time. I have one right now. I, it's just a regular thing for me. We got to, you know, we got to kind of like break this mindset that we, it, it is not an early withdrawal against your 401k. You are not just like tapping into your retirement account and getting taxed or penalized. You're not losing your contribution from your employer when you do it. All the beautiful things are your 401k stay in place. What this is for me in my mindset is I'm able to reallocate my money easily. I had $50,000 in the 401k there. I'm now wanting to put it into a different asset class. And it's just really easy to do. The the vehicle to do that is to take a loan against your 401k. The the 401k loses $50,000 in essence there. You gain $50,000 personally, and then you can use that $50,000 personally to go and make a better investment. That better better investment is turnkey rental properties or private lending or any type of could be any investment, but you know we we have a lean towards real estate here. So, you know I think people get hung up on this interest rate. I want to explain this to people. When you take a loan against your four hundred one k, there is an interest rate, but this is not an interest rate that you're paying to the bank. Usually, when we see interest on a loan, you're like, oh, cool, that's money I'm losing. That's not what's happening here. In a four hundred one k loan. Your loan, your 401k loans the money to you personally, and you personally pay the loan, pay the 401k back over time. So if the interest rate is 5% or 10% or 15%, it doesn't matter. It's you paying yourself back later on. You're not losing this money to a bank. It's one of the mis- most misunderstood things about a 401k loan. They are super simple and super easy to do. It's usually just a few clicks of your mouse. And uh, I think it usually costs like a hundred bucks to do the loan. You don't have to qualify or anything like that because again, you're loaning it to yourself. You're loaning it from the 401k that you own to you personally and a great source of hidden capital that I would imagine most of you out there, if not all of you have access to. So highly, highly would encourage you to look into that because I just think that as an economy and as a society, we are way over dependent on the stock market. And if each of us looked at how that asset was performing and compared it apples to apples to real estate, you'd probably say, hmm, it's probably time for real estate to at least have a seat in the table. And the 401k loan is an easy way for you to reallocate and get real estate a seat at the table in your investment portfolio. With that being said, Marilyn Codman, home of Home of Sauce Florida, home of the Manatee says, do you plan to buy more turnkey or DIY homes? Yeah, I'm not buying anything currently. I am watching the market, but 
I can say that, you know, 100%, if I'm going to buy more properties from here, they would probably all be turnkeys. Love that. Love that. I know somebody who can help you there, Dr. Chris. Raj Bantu, Ride Along Raj says, what was your primary motivation for getting into single family rentals? Have you considered multi-unit properties? Great question. I have. I do have a couple of duplexes in my portfolio and they they perform really well from a cash flow perspective. They don't appreciate as well as single family homes, at least in my experience. I actually have a friend right now I'm, I'm working with to try, he wants to buy a like a four, like a quad. And I'm, I'm kind of helping him navigate the market and look for properties. And it kind of got me thinking about it as well. But at the time it was all single family. That's sort of what I kind of got good at. And I just stuck with it. Yeah, you know, the multifamily question is is very common comparing it to single family as well. And and you know, Chris invests in Jacksonville, like we are based in Jacksonville, and most of the assets in the neighborhoods that you want to be in in Jacksonville are single family. That's just the way that it's built. You know, if you go to the Northeast, I'm sure there's a lot more multifamily properties. So, you know, uh, I'm agnostic when it comes to multifamily and single family, but I'm not willing to to go into neighborhoods that are not ideal neighborhoods in order to search for multifamily. And I think that's that would be a lesson for all of these single family, multifamily. They can both be great asset class, but stick to the formula that works. And I do think that you're you're absolutely right as far as consistency and ability to appreciate, especially in a high interest rate environment. Single family homes have a much easier path for home price appreciation than multifamily homes do, because multifamily homes are almost all investors, and they are much more sensitive to high interest rates, which is the environment that we are in right now. A couple questions here, and we're going to wrap up the show here in just a second here. Marilyn Codman again, she said, are physicians anything like engineers? Dr. Chris seems to be a numbers person with calculating deals. Are you a numbers person, Dr. Chris? I am a numbers person. If, <laughs> if Dave Van Horn is still in the audience, he said that, that with his particular company, they put doctors and engineers in the same category because we're all very analytical. You know, <laughs> so what, absolutely, have... yes. We have so many great client relationships and a lot of doctors and a lot of engineers. And it's those that want to make decisions based on numbers and then let the asset perform. We tend to not get emotionally involved in these assets. And that's really a success trait when it comes to investing. And then Marilyn says, as a doctor, are you connected to a hospital that offers something like a 401k or do you have to invest for yourself, such as with Roths or traditional IRAs? No, we're a private group, so we're not associated with a hospital. We have our own uh, profit sharing that we use for our 401k. And then I have my own you know, uh, Roth and standard IRAs on top of that. Fantastic, Chris. We're going we're gonna to send you off here in just a second. But I, again, I wanted to encourage folks to reach out to you if they do have questions. You know, I, this whole community is so giving of their time. You know, there are so many folks in the chat that are, are willing, whether that is Lee, Bishop, or Jen, or others. I, I thank you so much for making yourself available. Just a, a great testament to our, our community here. And it's one of the reasons that you all keep showing up. And I want to say thank you to you all for being here. I wanted to give you some stats here on the type of growth that our community has had just in the past few months. Uh, our live audience has grown by roughly 40% over the last few months, 40% over the last few months. So I want to say thank you so much for all of you being here live. That's not just the people that you know listen on the podcast or on the replay or whatnot, like we're growing here. This is the place to be here live in the Zoom meeting in the live audience if you want to be a part of the Not Your Average Investor community. And so if you are listening on the podcast, we want you here. You'll want to check it out. It's incredible here. You'll go to nyais.com and you can uh, get a link for free to join the live audience. That's nyais.com. Also do want to encourage you to take part in the Not Your Average Investor Guide. That is the way to go from zero to 60. You combine being here in the show in the live audience with being a part of the class and you're going to be on a path to success just like Dr. Chris here. If you want to enroll in the class, go to notyouraverageguide.com, notyouraverageguide.com. Chris, thank you so much for being here. It's uh, been an incredible journey listening to your journey. It's been incredible serving you for geez, five, six, seven years now. And I'm really excited about us helping each other grow and make this asset class more accessible. So thank you so much for spending your time. Did you have a good time on the Not Your Average Investor Show? I did. Thanks for having me. And thanks for everybody who came and asked questions and listened to us for an hour. How about that, man? It's pretty incredible having 60, 70 folks here 
um, tuning in to hear your story. So we'll keep the seat, seat warm for you. Uh, we'll have you back here in the, in the not too distant future, but thanks again for that. And thank you all for being here. Really excited about our show on Thursday. That's the client journey of the week, 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 week. We have Michael Santorios, who is in the audience today. He's going to be the featured guest. We're going to go through his client journey. You want to see somebody who is incredibly successful, Michael Santorios. He is going to be a fun story to break down. And I was with him the very first moment he started to invest with us. So we'll be able to kick back and go down memory lane a little bit. So thank you everybody for being here. And we look forward to seeing you on Thursday. And as I send you out, like our good buddy Pablo would, don't be average. See you everybody. <laughs>